people like Scott Ritter, head of intelligence during the weapons inspections from 91 to 98, said, no weapons of mass destruction. Hans Blix, the new UN inspector, goes and says, hey, no weapons of mass destruction. To which Deke Cheney told him to his face, we will not hesitate to discredit you. Well, the real intelligence failures may lie elsewhere. Physicians for Social Responsibility got a hold of some documents about a year ago after long litigation against Dick Cheney's energy task force, much of which is still going on. He doesn't want to sign and hand over any of those papers. Bush himself said last April, a country that hides something is a country that is afraid of getting caught. Well, that's why Cheney won't hand over the papers. But what turned up in the papers that Physicians for Social Responsibility did get from the Cheney Energy Task Force, you know, after the California energy crisis that was created in part by Enron turning off the faucet. Anyway, Cheney had, the task force had, a map of Iraqi oil fields, pipelines, terminals, and refineries accompanied by a list of potential buyers once we seized their country, which may explain why they were so asleep at the wheel around September 11th. I mean, this stuff alone is a worse scandal than Watergate, Contragate, and all the Reagan Gates combined, let alone Monica Lewinsky. But with all these scandals, the, the, the question is, what did the president know and when did he know it? And the scary part is, in this case, the answer is nothing. He never knew anything. For intelligence failure, first you need intelligence, right? And the 911 hearings and the ones on the intelligence failures, well, deliberate if you ask me, in Iraq, you know, they've turned up, you know, they basically portray something that's not being run like a White House or something serious. It's more like Spinal Tap, in a way. August 6th, the memo shows that Condoleezza got kind of lazy. She said, oh yeah, there was no silver bullet here, no smoking gun, but all it said was, bin Laden is ready to attack the United States in a big, big way. Part of the reason they didn't take it seriously, well, for one thing, Bush was on vacation. Hey, don't mess with Texas. I'm on Kansas City on vacation down here in Texas. Now hand me that Bible with the dime bag cut out into the pages here. Connie, get me some pretzels. <laughs> well, another reason that they were so asleep at the wheel, too, was not just obsession with staging a fake energy crisis and conquering Iraq, but documents show that the main focus of Condesleza and Rumsfeld, they thought the most important national security concern for us, hell, it's not global warming, it's lack of nuclear weapons in outer space. We must do whatever we can to make Ray Reagan's Star Wars wet dream come true and put nukes in space. Condesleza was scheduled to give a speech on September 11th about how desperately we needed nukes in space. And now that speech, of course, is classified. And the problem with those weapons is, I think I said this last time, what happens if they malfunction? Nuke a city and then they retaliate and go after us or Kind of the, one of those things comes back down and crashes and blows in the atmosphere like the Columbia did or whatever. If there's a nuclear warhead up there, 40, 50 pounds of, pounds of plutonium, that's enough plutonium dust to slowly blow all over our atmosphere and cause cancer in just about every breathing critter left on the planet. That scares me a lot more than North Korea, Saddam Hussein, or Al-Qaeda combined. Ashcrack was asleep at the wheel for another reason. Lobbying Congress at the time to slash another $600 million from the Justice Department's anti-terrorist efforts because he wanted to concentrate everything on the main threat to life as we know it, pornography. You ain't gonna let your eagle soar by looking at that pornography. That was the real intelligence failure. And they quietly announced in February 02 that Star Wars is on fast track. Now that so many tests have failed, let's just put them up there anyway and hope that they work. That's what I call an intelligence failure. And bravo 
to the leaders of Germany and France and the other countries who refused to go along with Bush and help invade Iraq. Never did I think I'd have a single good thing to say about Jacques Chirac, who in his own country is nicknamed Super Crook, among other things. But this time he did the right thing. But what do you want to bet? One of the main reasons these folks did the right thing in this, this case is because there were so many protesters in the streets in their country urging them not to get caught with their pants down licking bush this time around. And, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Anyway, you may recall that uh, Colin Powell was the one who drew the short straw and had to walk the plank and go to the United Nations and say that, uh, well, we know there's 100 to 500 tons of weapons of mass destruction. Here's your photographic proof, which to anybody else looked like a blurry aerial photo of a Walmart under construction in the desert somewhere. <laughs> But this was different. It had words with arrows pointing to various parts of the building. What more proof do you need? A truck on the ground. What does that tell you? And hey, not only that, but I, we, I got this, this information from an unimpeachable source, Tony Blair. Would he lie to you? Well, apparently he did, because his top secret information was swiped directly off the net. In another instance of government hacktivism by the powerful against the powerless, where it was a paper put up by somebody at the University of California, California State University at Monterey, who then went public and said, yo, if the guy had just come and talked to me, I could have given him current information. Those weapons totals in there are from 1991 and all. But no matter, Blair said that uh, Saddam Hussein, could strike our shores with nuclear weapons in 45 minutes. Okay. The excuses were getting really creative, artistic even, by then in our country too. We were saying that Saddam Hussein was hiding all his nuclear weapons and anthrax labs in trucks, driving up and down the pockmarked highways of Iraq. I haven't heard of hiding a nuke lab in a semi since Get Smart. And then we said that, oh, he's building a fleet of unmanned aircraft, drone planes, that could be used for actions targeting the United States, as if somehow a remote control plane could make it into the no-fly zone, across Turkey, across Europe, across the Atlantic, and crash into the Oval Office with nobody noticing. No problem running out of fuel. Well, they did find a dr one drone plane in Iraq, about so big, propeller-powered, fuselage made in part out of balsa wood, held together in part with duct tape. Well, what if Blair's right? Keep your eye on the sky, especially around the time of the Republican convention, and if you see a propeller plane coming slowly towards you with a ball fuselage of balsa wood and a nuclear bomb held on with duct tape, you have 45 minutes to go to any one of zillions of greasy fast food restaurants in this town, cover yourself with Crisco, roll in the cornflake crumbs, and say, okay, Colonel Sanders, I'm ready. Fry me! But of course, they fell for the nuclear argument, and maybe they thought there was money in it. I don't know, but Congress fell for it. John Kerry fell for it. But I've had trouble personally with photographic proof for many years, especially after I went to the Republican convention to cause some trouble in Philadelphia in 2000, and detoured into this, uh, detoured into this little exhibit hall that had a feel-good exhibit for all the peasants who couldn't get into the convention. History of conventions past, with first ladies' footwear under glass, and coffee table books about Bush's dad, and even their dog for sale. And then, right down from there, there was a photo booth where you could go in, get your picture taken, put it in Photoshop, monkey around with it for a minute, and out would come a glossy photograph of you hanging out with George W. Bush. And it looked totally real. Which makes me wonder how many of the 
news photos we see in papers and on the net, and even how much footage we see on television is not real, if it's that easy to manipulate it these days. Plenty of examples, you know, like the, uh, the report on Gulf, to get America drawn into Gulf War number one, that Saddam Hussein's savage army was storming hospitals in Kuwait and dumping premature babies out of incubators and leaving the little babies to die on the floor as they made off with the hospital equipment. And then they trotted out a seemingly shell-shocked young Kuwaiti woman to testify before Congress and thus the cameras as well. Look what they're doing to my country. Please, America. Save Kuwait for democracy. Turned out, story planted, woman hired by the Hill and Knowlton Agency, who were employed by the Kuwaiti royal family to use their PR prowess to wag the dog in this country and convince Americans that it was in our best interest to launch a full-scale war in a Mideastern country hardly anybody even knew existed just to put them on their throne, democracy be damned. And it turned out the little girl was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. One example. Gulf of Tonkin incident, even worse. 1964, splattered all over the corporate media. North Vietnamese gunboats fired on American ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. And that was all it took for Lyndon Johnson to ram through the uh, Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Again, Congress, just like the Patriot Act, being afraid of being labeled soft on communism. Only one senator had the spine to vote against it. Kablam! Vietnam War is on. What did that get us? Almost 60,000 Americans dead, many more, including some you know maybe, who were maimed and scarred for life. Death toll, again, over there, estimated between one and two million Vietnamese, and we still haven't cleaned up the Agent Orange over there that's making people sick and having birth defects and all. And now corporate media just shrugs their shoulders and acknowledges, as though it's no big deal, that the Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. Thanks for telling us now. And fast forward to the feel-good, rah-rah war patriotic tale of Jessica Lynch. Hyped as the first POW rescue since World War II. Poor Jessica, her Hummer got shot up or whatever, and she was pumped full of holes, then stabbed by Iraqi troops, and then for some weird reason they took her to the hospital anyway, but American commandos stormed the hospital, fought off Saddam Hussein's elite revolutionary guard, and whisked poor Jessica back to safety. A great feel-good, isn't war wonderful story if I've ever heard one. Trouble is, she even admitted on Diane Sawyer when her TV movie and the book she got a million bucks in advance for, although the ghostwriter took half, came out the same week, she admitted that never happened. No, she got hurt because her Hummer overturned and the people in the hospital who tried to tip the Americans they had her, tried to send her back to the Americans in an ambulance which got fired on so they had to turn around and go back and that there were no Iraqi soldiers in the hospital at all. They just came along firing blanks with cameras piped immediately to the Pentagon media area in Qatar, uh, Qatar rather, and then... Uh, over to us over here is the feel-good story of the dramatic live action footage rescue of Jessica Lynch. Diane Sawyer, trying to rescue the lie, then said, but, but, weren't you raped? I don't recall anything like that. Well, that means you could have been, couldn't you? Anything to hang on to the lie, which makes me wonder, with that going on, does Saddam Hussein even exist? <laughs> Does Osama bin Laden even exist? We never found him, not yet anyway. I mean, they always said Saddam had all these doubles, so who did they really pull out of the spider hole with a big old beard looking like Abby Hoffman on really bad drugs? And over and over again, looped on corporate news, see, we caught Saddam. We're looking at his teeth. We're looking at his teeth. Over and over again, they're looking at his teeth. Please, please, there's got to be 500 tons of weapons of mass destruction somewhere. <laughs> 
Brian Eno has a very good term for this, pointing out that our corporate media these days and its place in controlling society, it ain't just propaganda anymore, it's propaganda. Not just controlling what we think, but what we think about. Iraq war, a complete disaster that will pay for the rest of our lives? No, 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 what you've really got to be worried about is big-ass terrorist acts like Janet Jackson's titty. Oh my God, what are we going to do about Janet Jackson's titty? Oh my God, will Martha Stewart go to jail? Instead of, oh my God, why isn't Dick Cheney in jail? <laughs> what we're supposed to be here worried about is who's going to get fired by Donald Trump instead of who should be fired in Washington. <laughs> what we're supposed to be worrying about is which one of those hoes after hoes after hoes groveling before those snitty judges on American Idol will finally get crowned queen or king and get to roam the world singing the worst music I have ever heard. And they're moaning, oh my God, Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 911, we can't have that. It's slanted. It's propaganda. You want propaganda, look at any corporate news channel you want as to how they're covering the election this time around. Never have I seen such open bias towards one candidate over the other as if Kerry is some huge threat to their corporate order. Every little thing Kerry says, they blow up and pummel him on, but all the dumb stuff Bush says, they just let him slide. I'm going to extend child care, even to those who don't have children. <laughs> Nobody called him on it. To Gore in the second debate, live TV, you're talking about Social Security like it's some kind of federal program, which it is. And what does the USA Today say? But, well, Gore, quote, appeared better informed on the issues, but Bush, quote, appeared more likable, appeared more likable likable. Therefore, he won. That's the way they slanted it. I mean, Howard Dean yells once like the frat boy he is, and they just pummel him with that. Bush, you know, what the hell goes on behind closed doors with him? I have this vision that sometimes kept me awake at night of Bush running around in the war room or loose on the grounds of Camp David with his t-shirt pulled up over his head like Beavis in the cartoon. I'm the great Cornholio! I'm the great Cornholio! <laughs> I need more oil for my bunghole. <laughs> they just let him slide. I mean, now they're talking, oh my God, look what happened at the Kerry fundraiser. Oh no, people were using obscene language about our president in public. People were calling Bush a liar, oh my God, a cheap thug. Kerry must apologize for this. And typical Kerry, he's trying to distance himself from it. So playing into the corporate media thing that artists should not be political. It's not an artist's place to be political unless their name is Arnold Schwarzenegger, unless their name is Toby Keith, or unless their name is Mel Gibson. Then it's okay. Mel Gibson, who's so Taliban ash crack in the head, he's called people who criticize his movie in any way, Passion of the Christ, satanic. And one writer, I think it was from The New Yorker, he said he wanted to skin him alive and he wanted to kill his dog. How whack is that? I mean, all I can say about Mel's movie is I can hardly wait for the action figures. Yeah most openly biased election in my lifetime, but what's scarier still is the stuff they don't tell us. You know, as far as I'm concerned, corporate media deliberately underreporting or deliberately slanting a story or forgetting to tell anybody the story even happened is the worst form of censorship going on in the world today. For example, 
It shouldn't have been almost three years later that people had to find out from a Michael Moore movie about the Saudi airliner we let into our supposedly well-guarded airspace after September 11th to pick up all these members of the Bin Laden family and other Saudi money bags and get them back safely home before the FBI could talk to them. Or the one from August 23rd of 2003 in a British newspaper called The Guardian, you know, the best newspaper I've found in the English language that's a daily paper and everything. It's amazing how much more actual news coverage you get outside of this country, even in Canada, than you do here. You know, more, more in-depth reporting, more sides of the story presented. Guardian you can read at guardian.co.uk, by the way. And among their many mind-blowing stories was August 23rd, 2003, a reporter named Rory McCarthy wrote a piece saying that George W. Bush and Pervez Musharraf, the dictator of Pakistan, had reached a little understanding with each other not to seize or kill Osama bin Laden to let him walk and frolic in the woods or whatever. And the reason cited in the article was fear that there would be such a bad backlash if he got captured or killed with Pakistani involvement that Musharraf would fall and possibly be replaced by Taliban types, many of whom are in the Pakistani armed forces. But obviously another reason too. Why pick up bin Laden now when Kerry might be leading in the fall, and you can pick him up October 15th. If Bush is in any real trouble, expect Bin Laden to magically appear. Never mind all that. What we need is regime change. Regime change. You know, another one of those little lovely buzz phrases I never heard before he we went into Iraq, before that. But don't other countries need a regime change too? You know, why that guy? Why not Saudi Arabia? Why not China? Why not Israel? Why not the United States of America? And by that, I don't mean taking out corporatoid number one and replacing him with corporatoid number two in the form of John Kerry and expecting everything to magically improve. I mean, bulldozing all those corporate puppets off the nearest cliff into the sea and replacing them with true patriotic Americans who give a damn about this country and the environment and other people in other countries and are more interested in doing what needs to be done and doing the right thing than piling up brownie points so they can get on Boeing's board of directors when they leave office or something like that. Again, my memory goes back far enough to when there was a difference between the Democratic and Republican Party besides gay rights and abortion, and the people who ran for office were more interested in leadership than deal-making and all. But we have to go after Saddam Hussein. I saw him do this once on CNN. Bush cocked his head, got his little smirk. Saddam Hussein is an evil man. No argument there. I'm glad we don't live in a country run by somebody like that, or none of us would be around to attend this conference today. But Saddam Hussein was the same evil man he was throughout the last decade when he didn't attack us or his neighbors, and the same evil man he was throughout the 1980s when we couldn't sell him enough weapons of mass destruction. Our golden boy we prodded and paid to fight a war against the Ayatollah to make sure that the Ayatollah's fundamentalism didn't spread to Saudi Arabia. You know, we supplied him with all kinds of weapons, intelligence, all kinds of fertilizers and chemicals we knew he was going to use to gas his own people, and even after he started doing it, we supplied him with some more. And guess who went to Iraq in 1983 to shake Saddam's hand in front of the cameras to seal the deal that he was our new special ally in the Middle East? Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah. That's why Saddam says, you put me on trial, I'm calling Rumsfeld as a witness. See if they report that on CNN. And you know what Rumsfeld gave him as a token of our appreciation? A pair of golden spurs. 
Saddam was our golden boy to the point where he felt perfectly comfortable notifying us in advance he was going to invade Kuwait. And what did our ambassador April Glaspie do but write him back saying, we have no opinion on your border disputes with other countries. Come on in. That was uh, what we thought of Saddam Hussein at the time. And is this totally about oil? I think there may be more to it than that. Some of you may know of a publication called Harper's Magazine that in the first, first few pages always has a page called Harper's Index with all these mind-blowing facts and figures and statistics and all. And one of them in about May or so in 2002 really blew my mind. It said, amount we spend every year, and this is before the war, guarding our oil supply in the Persian Gulf 50 billion dollars. Value of the crude coming from the Gulf that we actually use in this country, 19 billion dollars. What is wrong with this picture? Especially when the whole time we were telling everybody else in the world, don't you dare buy any of Saddam's oil because of the sanctions, we were buying two-thirds of his oil, and the only reason he could pump it out of the ground was he'd paid $28 billion to a company called Halliburton to rebuild his oil infrastructure, Halliburton at that time, run by a guy named Dick Cheney. But what it really boils down to, I think, is the curse of the wolf man. Curtin, let me explain. There was a document that's been fairly widely documented now, 1991, commissioned by Bush's dad called the National Security Guideline. And its authors were Paul Wolfowitz, a chicken hawk, and Lewis Libby, another chicken hawk whose nickname is Scooter. And they came back with this document that was so wildly paranoid, it said that now that there's no more nuclear threat from the Soviets and the evil empire has collapsed, the world is a vastly more dangerous place. And because now we must view all our allies as, quote, potential competitors who had to be prevented from, quote, aspiring to a greater regional or global role than we have in mind for them. And it also said that U.S. military invasions of other countries should be, quote, a constant feature of global affairs. Even Bush's father thought this was insane and should have thrown Wolfman and Scooter in a padded cell right then and there, but he just made him rewrite it and they've lived to wreck the world again. Wolfowitz, of course, is now number two to Rumsfeld in the Defense Department. Prediction is he's going to get Rumsfeld's job if Bush gets in again, while Scooter is Dick Cheney's chief of staff. When Clinton was in power, some of these thugs migrated over to a group called Project for a New American Century that in addition to Wolfman and Scooter included Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Jeb Bush, and another visionary, Dan Quayle, who were bombarding President Clinton with letters and studies saying we must invade Iraq right now and we should get rid of all UN peacekeeping missions everywhere and have American troops do all of it. Why? Well, I mean, Rumsfeld kind of looks like the guy in Pinky and the Brain, right? Take over the world! They said that was okay. And all we needed to jumpstart this was, quote, a new Pearl Harbor. And another thing factoring into all this is every time we go into that part of the world, we come to visit and decide to stay. We got military bases now in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, all the, because of all the problems, we're slowly moving most of that to the big new one in Qatar, got one in Bahrain, got one in Oman, got one across from the bottom of Saudi Arabia, across the bottom of the Red Sea in a little country called Djibouti, got them in Turkey, putting them up in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Halliburton intimately involved, of course, Uzbekistan, I think Tajikistan is the other one, and we're talking about keeping 14 military bases in Iraq permanently, regardless of whether the Iraqis want us to leave. 14 new Guantanamo bays, regardless of whether anybody wants it or not. Why? 
Why so much military presence in that part of the world if that $19 billion worth of crude is only 10% of our gluttonous consumption? Why? Unless it's to implement the curse of the wolfman. Hey, France. Hey, Germany. Hey, China. Japan. You aspire to a greater regional or global role than we have in mind for you? We're just going to turn the faucet off because we don't have to have Persian Gulf crude, but we know that you do. And that means from now on, we've got you and your economies by the nuts. That's basically what that means. But what about the people who live there? Even Bush's father in his memoirs said the reason he didn't invade Iraq all the way and try to occupy the country, he listed all the things that are going wrong today. Bush said, well, he's the wrong father to appeal to. In terms of strength, there is a higher father that I appeal to. Well, they are so out of it. I mean, this is the problem when you rely on think tank yahoos to, do, to conduct foreign policy and chicken hawks to run a war. You know, you can memorize all the statistics and strategies you want, but that's no substitute for hanging out and talking with terrorists or whatever. It's the same as the difference between a baseball fan who knows everybody's batting average and all these weird statistics and actually playing on a baseball team. Dick Cheney, Chicken Hawk, said when we go into Iraq, I believe we will be greeted as liberators. We were not greeted as liberators. Whole country's going postal. Iraqis getting madder and madder that we ain't leaving. And while low carb everything, including rum I've now noticed, is a big trend over here, Kidnappings, beheadings, and bombings are the trend over there and already spreading outside of Iraq as the first sign of a worldwide intifada against us. Not just the Bush mob, us. That scares me. And the last thing we ever wanted over there was democracy. After all, our own president wasn't elected either. And if they did have an election, look who would win at this point. Whoever wanted to wage the most jihad against the infidel United States. And that just doesn't go for Iraq. It goes for the populace of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Kuwait, you name it. And ha here's the real ticking bomb is half the population in those countries is under 25 and the job growth and the e economic growth is nil, basically. Average Saudi income has been cut by two thirds down to eight grand a year while the royal family makes off with all the money and we support them. And then Bush is saying, well, I don't understand why people hate us. They hate us because they hate our freedom. No, they hate us because we won't let them have any freedom. That's why they hate us. And instead of liberation, we seriously expected to get rid of Saddam and put in our own Saddam, a guy named Ahmed Chalabi, who hadn't set foot in Iraq in 47 years, but had Wolfman and the neocons convinced that a huge guerrilla army would rise to follow him and eventually managed to round up 100 guys before we went in. This guy came from the richest family in Iraq who had to flee the country in the late 50s when he was a teenager. And more importantly, he's on the run to this day from a 22-year prison sentence in Jordan for ripping anywhere from 30 million to 100 million bucks out of his own bank. That is the equivalent of somebody invading this country and saying, now that we've liberated you and you have your freedom, here's your new president. His name is John Dillinger basically. And even though Chalabi is now on the outs with the Bush people, they figured out he's a con man, took us for 39 million bucks, got us into a war, and was apparently spying for Iran the entire time. You know, only Bush's people could fall for something like that, you know, the real intelligence failure. But 
Chalabi's brother is in charge of prosecuting Saddam Hussein still, and Chalabi's cousins and relatives have seized control of the Iraqi banking system still. And then Chalabi was merely supposed to act as a front for Bremer. When he came in, he walks in and fires 400,000 soldiers, replaces them with nobody. You know, which the soldiers said, shit, we've still got our weapons. We didn't rise up and fight the Americans, and this is the thanks we get? No pay, no job, no pension? 100,000 government bureaucrats who kept the country functioning fired, replaced with nobody. All the cops fired, replaced with nobody. No wonder all hell broke loose, basically. And uh, you know, when Sada after Gulf War number one, according to occupationwatch.org, which is a really interesting site to look at for what's really going on in Iraq and how the Iraqi people are really suffering over there from homelessness, disease, lack of clean water, electricity still ain't working, no jobs, no security, crime through the roof, women scared to go outside unless there's an American television crew with them to show that everything's safe and all. But, uh, they point out that after Gulf War number one, Saddam Hussein's people had the electricity and the phones up in two months. And it's still barely functioning, if it's functioning at all, in Iraq. And the really obscene part of this is things aren't getting done and things aren't working because they're not supposed to. Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, once said, he was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. That's what's going on in Iraq right now. Bremer, when he fired all those people, also announced Iraq is open for business. Not Iraqi business, not the experts who would know how the electricity grid actually worked and how to deal with the waterworks or might want to guard the facilities before they got looted right down to hospital beds while our troops stood idly by and Rumsfeld just said, oh, freedom is untidy. No, they weren't allowed to have any jobs. Only privateers and pirates who worked for companies like Halliburton and their subsidiary, Kellogg, Brown, and Root, Bechtel, and the rest. The ones who a long time ago got in on the gravy train in the Reagan days of billing the Pentagon $3,000 apiece for screwdrivers, $600 apiece for toilet seats, no questions asked. Clinton didn't bother to prosecute anybody when he got in. Gulf War number one, fax machines, $40,000 apiece. Why? Well, well, um, they, they don't get sand in them. All you have to do to keep sand out of a fax machine is put it in a box or wrap it in a plastic bag and save $40,000. But that's not how the game is supposed to be played, is it? It's where the money is. And with that in mind, I mean, Halliburton's already been busted for ripping us off for 30 million bucks and overcharging for gasoline. Kellogg, Brown, and Root, their subsidiary, got caught tripling the price of gym towels for soldiers. How petty is that? The excuse being, well, they're three times as much because we sewed the initials KBR onto the towels. Therefore, it's okay. Who knows what else is going on that we haven't even heard about yet. It was in that spirit that Bremer said to the Iraqis, yeah, you can get your clean water back, but it's going to cost you $15 billion and take four years. No wonder people are a little upset over there. And this is why, in contrast to the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, get the infrastructure going again after World War II, modern money cost of that was $47.6 billion. Gulf War number one cost about $60 billion, most of which was paid, 80% of which was paid by our allies. But with this looting, Corporate looting and racketeering and privateering going on in Iraq, Bush has already blown over a hundred billion dollars with much more to come. Last fall, he demanded another 87 billion dollars and Congress just gave it to him. Almost no questions asked. Kerry did vote against that one. I don't know how Edwards voted. But of the $87 billion, 66 of it classified. Wouldn't even say how it's doled out. $412 million just for construction of Wolfman's military bases 
and 353 million for the private sector, read bribes and graft, 400 million for two maximum security prisons. How do you blow $400 million on two jails? You can build a domed football stadium for that amount of money. What are they going to do? Put an Olympic-sized pool with gold faucets in every cell? Free heroin for life? No. We need that much money because, quote, you have to import the cement. What do you make cement out of that you can find everywhere in Iraq? Yep, got to import the cement. Another $100 million to build seven gated suburbs, American style, probably for the American privateers, 3,500 housing units only in a country where we've made millions of people homeless. Another $2.1 billion down the drain to put the oil facilities back together after Halliburton already got a no-bid contract for $12 billion to put up the uh, oil facilities, signed almost two weeks before we went in on the war in secret, of course. But in spite of all that, for the oil infrastructure, another $900 million to import oil products in a country sitting on the second largest reserves in the world. And let's not forget, speaking of hacktivism or something, maybe not, a $54 million computer study of Iraq's postal service. For less than 10% of that, they could hire mailmen to just deliver the damn mail like they always did. Oh, no. And another, now Bush wants another $25 billion, in addition to the $87 billion, including $100 million to hire private security to guard the so-called green zone. You know what the green zone is? It's a nice, posh area with lots of office buildings in downtown Baghdad. We mysteriously forgot to bomb, then put a Berlin Wall up around it so the Iraqis can't get into their own downtown, and we intend to stay there. And the $100 billion is for 14 months. We're also planning to build the largest and most fortified embassy ever constructed in the history of the world. We ain't giving them back their sovereignty. We plan to stay for a long, long time. And this is what our soldiers are dying for in Iraq right now. We're getting to that. <laughs> All this before media activists managed to get out into the public the pictures and the footage from Abu Ghraib prison. Never mind, it's been no secret in the European media for a year earlier that people were being tortured to death in Afghanistan, conditions in Guantanamo Bay, and things like that. And these pictures never would have gotten out except for guerrilla media, except for independent media. Uh, you're getting ahead of me here. <laughs> I intend to get to all that intimately. And I don't have that much time left. I have so much of my big mouth needs, that I need to cover here. Anyway, you know, those prisons and what we're doing in there, that's what Saddam Hussein used to do. That's what Stalin and Hitler used to do. This is not the United States of America we were brought up to pledge allegiance to, is it? But Lindy England, you know, the female soldier grinning and giving the thumbs up and everything else, said, quote, we thought it looked funny, so we took pictures. We thought it looked funny, so we took pictures. What created that? She may look a lot like Squeaky From, but inside she's a hell of a lot more the, like Susan Atkins, the real psychopath of the Manson family. And if it was really just a few bad apples, which I doubt, doing this in the prisons, who was there, Charles Manson? Rumsfeld? His boss, perhaps? And what's especially interesting to me is a lot of the people who've gotten caught torturing Iraqi prisoners, many of which we now admit were probably being held there for the wrong reasons, if any reasons at all. Oh, that's not what my watch says, dude. Anyway, um, you know, but a lot of them were prison guards over here. 
And if that's what they think is normal and funny over there, what are they doing to people that they think is acceptable over here? Occasionally, things leak out, like in 1996 when Bush was governor in Texas, a video snuck out of prisoners being forced to crawl, being beaten, out, the crap beat out of them with batons, and being bitten by dogs, if that sounds familiar. Corcoran Prison in California, guards were caught staging basically cockfights with human beings, mysteriously opening doors to cells of prisoners who were in rival gangs, allowing them to bump into each other in the commons, try to kill each other, and then, well, we had to break up the fight, so we had to kill them. Placing bets and everything. Pelican Bay, Northern California, the prison, there was a mentally ill prisoner who finally won his lawsuit for damages years later after they immersed him in boiling water. You know, that's what's been going on in this country and why, you know, the police always get away with all the brutality. My God, that rogue officer, you know what we did to him? We've reassigned him. Shot another black guy in the back? Oh, we've reassigned him. Suspended him 30 days without pay. Of course, this has probably also destroyed what little respect we have left in the Middle East, Europe, wherever. I mean, you know, Bush is now the most hated president abroad in history by far. When people ask what they fear for their security, they don't say terrorists, they say mad cowboy disease, basically, <laughs> even in Canada. As Bill Maher put it, how bad do you have to suck to lose a popularity contest with Saddam Hussein. I mean, the most constructive thing we could be doing is admit to the world right now, okay, we made a mistake, we're getting out. Get out of Iraq now. People responsible resign now. And end not just the military occupation, but end the economic occupation as well. They say, we can't do that. How are we going to lose face? We've lost it already. Well, how are we going to leave? It's like Vietnam. We have no idea how to get out. We never planned for that. Easy way to leave. Ships, trucks, and airplanes. Same as the way we went in. Yes, we owe the Iraqi people help in rebuilding the country we blew up after propping up Saddam Hussein in the first place, but that does not mean so, you know, sending more troops into the desert to act as security for Halliburton and Bechtel. It means letting the United Nations or somebody else the Iraqi people actually respect run the show. We help them. We give them the money. Not we police them, but we help them. Of course, corporate republicrats won't hear of that. House uh, major Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat, and Kerry have both said what we need to do is send 40,000 more troops to Iraq. 40,000 more in to get the troops out? That doesn't make sense. And the way to make people like that listen is in the voting booth and in the streets, starting now. Meanwhile, military recruiting, the Pentagon now admits it's going down, 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 down. Almost a 25% drop in National Guard enlistments alone, according to ABC News. 600 soldiers who went on leave from Iraq never came back. Bush is waiving $10,000 bonus bonuses at any GI who's willing to re-enlist, and there aren't that many takers. So what is their solution to that? Well, this went up on a Defense Department website last fall. Defend America, serve your community and the nation, join your local draft board. And now that they've got the kind of people they want on the draft boards, they've upped the selective service budget, you know, the people who run the draft, by another $28 million for preparation. And already, Bush has recalled 6,000 people who were already out of the military back to duty and drafted them to go back to Iraq. And Rumsfeld has even talked about, well, we have a draft. It'll be a special skills draft. We mainly want people to fill specific holes in the military. 
people who know Middle Eastern languages and people who are good with computers. So, hello, and don't think you can get to Canada as easily this time because Tom Ridge made a deal with Cretchen up there before Cretchen left office to tighten their asylum laws so draft dodgers can't get in anymore. After all, it might cause terrorism and prevent them from drafting you to help die for Wolfman and Bush and Dick Cheney's friends. In World War II, it was different. The profiteers were, uh, um, I know, I know, we'll get to that. The prof people who tried to profit off the war were considered traitors. They were brought to justice, and one of the lead prosecutors before he moved up was Harry Truman. Now, the opposite. But as far as I'm concerned, if Bill Clinton could get impeached for unauthorized weenie moistening, and the governor of California recalled for raising the tax on cars, shouldn't George Bush, Dick Cheney, and every member of Congress who keeps giving him the money for the war be impeached for treason? <laughs> Meanwhile, what can we do to save ourselves from being dragged any further down the road to ruin and off a cliff and down the toilet by a bush, a dick, and a colon? <laughs> Don't believe the hype. We are patriotic citizens too because we're the ones who give a damn about this country and give a damn about the world around us and are willing to get off our butts to make it better. And I'm all for insurrection in the street, but that doesn't get that much done without insurrection in the voting booth, too. How many of you are registered to vote? That's way higher than most people I talk to, but it's far from 100%, and far from how many people would show up if we all went out and got more of our friends to register and show up and vote smart. Not just nationally, but one of the most important reasons to vote is local elections. It matters who's mayor, who's on the city council, who's in the state legislature, who's on the school board. And we have a privilege in this country that they don't have in Canada. They don't have in any European country I know of, and that's called the ballot initiative the propositions where you get to vote yay or nay on changing the law when politicians are too corrupt or chicken shit to do it themselves. And when we show up, that's how we get things like medical marijuana, rent control, living wage laws, ecological land use laws and all. And if we don't show up, you can bet the Christian coalition and the Hummerheads will. So many people show up, not only, so few people show up in local elections that um, they, you know, when, if more people like us show up, we have that much better chance of getting good people elected and good laws passed. And I'm hoping this whole groundswell of, of, of insurrection against Bush, against the war, will blossom into a much bigger version of the anti-corporate rule, anti-globalization, spirit of Seattle insurrection, too. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm almost done. <laughs> And the beauty of it all, no matter what they try to impose on us through Orrin Hatch or whatever else, I've said this every time, that's the beauty of the digital age, no matter what they do to try and cage us, some bored teenager out there somewhere is gonna find a way to get around and wreck the whole thing. But what will happen to them if John Ashcroft is still the Attorney General? What will happen to them if Kerry is president, for that matter? I can understand the anybody but Bush sentiment, but the last time people voted that way, we got Clinton. And then look what we got. 
NAFTA, WTO, the Telecommunications Act that gave away the airwaves to corporations. If Kerry gets in, this time we can't just go to sleep for eight years. We got to get the biggest blowtorch we can find and keep it up his ass the whole time he's there. Personally, I vote my conscience and I, if I'm going to vote for Kerry, he's got to convince me by telling me what he's going to do about the drug war, whether he's going to abolish the Patriot Act, all of it, what he's going to do to fix our welfare laws so poor people have a chance. And for that matter, when we have that blowtorch, what are we in this room going to do? I mean, Steve Wozniak was here earlier, and there's always people at this convention who, you know, aren't half as down on the big plundering CEOs as they wish they were one of them. You know, that's why so many people got conned in the dot-com boom in San Francisco by bigger greed heads. They just bought into it all. Don't let it happen to you. Help people build sharper bullshit detectors by spreading information and education. Knowledge is power, after all, and the power to influence and break down the limits on freedom and make them harder to impose. You know, help make history instead of just watching it on TV or gossiping it on the net, about it on the net. Resistance, after all, don't let anybody from the farty old left or the Uber PC people tell you that resistance shouldn't be fun. Granted, it's not all Disney fun, but it's not some no, it's just grim struggle against the fascist pigs either. You know, some of these big protests, they've been like giant parties and everything. I don't have time to the pr for the pranks I was going to get to. But basically, this time, as much as file sharing and software are important, right now we're fighting for our survival. Not just the survival of our cultures, but the survival of freedom as we know it on this planet. We can't avoid getting in the ring with these people anymore because they are already in the ring with us. Thanks for listening. Yes. Okay, we're well, last done. You may remember last time I had, how many of you were here last time? I had these albums from corporate sales conventions. You can now start changing the stage, by the way, too. We got a music section going on now here. I wasn't able to bring any of those this time. For those of you who don't know, these were souvenir albums given by corporations at salesmen or executive conventions where they'd hire a vaudeville troupe to compose and perform a musical about how great the corporation is and all. So, for the, I, the person back with the CDs, take the one called Product Music, that is uh, um, the one with a little man on it, and play track two from the Ford Motor Company and track three from the American Standard Toilet Fixture Convention of 1968. Have fun! Oh, and one other last thing. Um, I do have some stuff out in the hall this time if anybody's interested in my spoken word albums. And also, I'm making a new music album with the Melvins, which should be out in October. I'm a tractor driving man. If I'm bragging, don't mind me. When you're looking for me, 